good evening, everyone. The topic of this session is the old, the new, and the unconventional assessing contemporary conflicts. And of course, the bulk of this conversation will feature Ukraine, but there are other challenges too, from Iran to North Korea to the spy balloons and everything in between. So we will talk about them and the changing nature of warfare. With me are three men who've led their forces and shaped the military strategy of their country. General Campbell, General Chauhan, General Mattis, Good evening and welcome. Thank you. General Campbell, uh, I'll, I'll begin with you. The war in Ukraine has completed one year. And in the last 365 days, we've di seen different phases of it. We've seen rockets, bullets, bombs, and of course, unconventional tactics like cyber attacks. How do you assess the conflict as it stands today and the directions that it has taken over the past one year? Uh, look, thanks for the question. It, it is something that everybody, of course, uh, is very interested in. Uh, I'm going to start by just emphasizing, as many panelists have, this is an illegal, unjust, outrageous invasion and violation of sovereign territory and the integrity of a sovereign nation. <laughs> And it is being waged from a, uh, the perspective of the Russian forces in a deeply unethical and immoral fashion. Uh, and uh, it is a travesty of everything that a professional military should aspire to do in defense of sovereignty and integrity. In terms of where we are, war is a clash of wills. Everything else is and emerges from that. Uh, what I see is a Ukrainian uh, nation uh, unified under extraordinary leadership and uh, with a will determined to resist. Equally, uh, I don't see any change yet in the intent to prosecute at whatever cost to his own forces, his own country, and the people of Ukraine, uh, being shown by President Putin uh, in his determination to continue to prosecute uh, this conflict. And I'm reminded of Minister Rasmussen's comment uh, yesterday evening that if Russia uh, ceases to fight, the war ends. If Ukraine ceases to fight, Ukraine ends. This clash of wills at present has shown and demonstrated some extraordinary success by the Ukrainian armed forces and the Ukrainian people. Extraordinary. And centered on it is an utter determination to resist and to see their country free of Russian presence and domination. But until we see a fracture in will, and from my perspective, a fracture in President Putin's will, unfortunately, this war is going to continue, is my assessment. And it is, it is a disaster for the people of Ukraine. It's also a disaster for a lot of mothers of Russia. And uh, I am uh, incredibly impressed by a wide coalition of nations who've come to support Ukraine, whether it is diplomatically or materially, humanitarian or in lethal arms. But until will changes, I think this war is going to continue. You called war a clash of wills. Um, how do you see NATO's role in this? Is this de facto now a NATO versus Russia war? Not at all. Not at all. This is a Ukrainian defense of Ukraine. And uh, yes, uh, members of NATO and members of the wider international community, such as Australia uh, and other countries from the Indo-Pacific, are seeking to assist Ukraine and their capacity to resist and defend. Uh, but uh, this is not uh, a war as you have characterized it, which I think uh, not wishing to 
uh, impugn your comment, but it is a comment that is comfortably played by President Putin and those who support his regime uh, to suggest in some way uh, that uh, an international uh, coalition have attacked uh, their own country, which is rubbish. This is an unprovoked attack on an independent sovereign nation by a brutal regime. General Chauhan, uh, Randy Howard just said that this war in Ukraine uh, is, is giving the world a blueprint for future wars. Uh, and I'm sure India has been uh, watching the developments closely. Uh, how have these events made you, and if they've made you, reconsider India's defense priorities and preparedness? Uh, uh, you can look at any conflict with a number of uh, perspectives and viewpoints, you know. So you can have a perspective from a political point of view, uh, probably from an economic point of view or a diplomatic point of view. But uh, as an army officer and as a CDS, I see this war from the point of view of military practitioner act. So we are looking at you know, uh, what kind of lessons uh, from this particular war are applicable in the Indian context. Obviously, our situations are entirely different. So we look at that. While we even look at that, we also like to see, uh, we also understand that, you know, uh, there are no universally acceptable kind of lessons from this particular war. So, and in this particular war, you find a lot of, it's a different kind of a war. Earlier, we all assumed that future wars are going to be short, swift, and fast. And, but this is a very longish kind of a war, which we are seeing. Uh, and it has created many, many kind of contradictions, actually. Say earlier when we thought that, you know, uh, we thought about dispersion and demassification was one. And now, you know, over here, uh, what we are seeing right now with the stage in which the war has entered, we find concentrated kind of attack. <coughs> we found, you know, equipment which we thought was means of offensive operations, etc. That whole paradigm is uh, getting changed. Uh, so there are a number of uh, lessons, actually, which uh, we could uh, take from this particular war. But then as, uh, as far as we are concerned, we got to see that how these lessons actually are applicable for the Indian Armed Forces and what lessons we should take from this. If you ask me, uh, some of the lessons could be from this particular war would be uh, that uh, we get to be self-reliant actually. That's the biggest lesson actually for us. So we can't be dependent on uh, uh, supply of our weapon systems, etc. from outside. That's the one big lesson that uh, we take from uh, this particular conflict. You think it's become a war of attrition now? Yes, of course, you know, if you look at what's happening right now, is we have uh, entered into a stage where the front lines are hardly moving. And today and yesterday, Bakhmut, if you see, uh, even a three kilometer advance is being claimed by success uh, by the Russians, uh, by the same army which uh, prided itself into a deep battle kind of a concept of what the Americans called as air land battle sometime back, in which uh, synchronization and, you know, Simultaneity was of uh, essence, actually, and you know you could non-linearity was there. You could attack targets much in depth, right from the front, middle, and rear areas. But now we got stuck into a kind of warfare, which is uh, reminiscence of what you could say was uh, First World War, trench kind of warfare. That's what we are actually uh, stagnated into. This all has its own different kind of uh, lessons. In this. <coughs> General Mattis, your assessment of the war, and we know that America has sent more than $50 million billion in aid, military and non-military aid, and weapons, and I uh, understand that the West is now racing against time to uh, send more weapons to Ukraine. Would you say that this war has also exposed the limits of the capacity of the West's <coughs> weapons manufacturing industry? Yeah, you know, I can give you an argument that Russia would win this war in the first three weeks if you quantify what Russia had versus what Ukraine had. Uh, they should have been inside Kiev, and I can give you every objective a measure that would say Russia won. But what you see here is the Western aid coming in to the valiant Ukrainian people, giving them the means to rebuff them, and not just rebuff them, but to throw them out of the country after penetrating 
dozens of kilometers inside. And as you look at this, we're reminded of one of the lessons of history that were mentioned by the, uh, the earlier speaker up here. And that is, nations with allies thrive, nations without allies wither. And you are watching Russia wither before our very eyes. The Western nations can continue to provide this aid so long as the will of the people, because we are democracies, our governments follow the will of the people, so long as that holds, we can continue to do this. But remember that it was the human factors that threw the Russians back initially. The valiant Ukrainian fighters with the support of their society under a tenacious leader who is reminding us that leadership matters, uh, especially when, as Prime Minister Modi pointed out, this is not an era of war, but when war intrudes, you've got to deal with it. And what is the real indicator of what I would call democracies, not just the West, but democracies' response? Sweden last joined a military alliance in Napoleon's time, 200 years ago. 200 years they maintained neutrality. Throughout the Cold War, Finland maintained its neutrality. That was the best way for them, acting on their own best interests, to have their own sovereignty. And today, following this savage attack, what you have is both of those nations, the people have turned overwhelmingly toward only an alliance can now provide deterrence. So watch this. Back when I was a NATO Supreme Allied Commander, I had Russian officers on my staff. Russian officers walked freely through the NATO headquarters in the 1990s, 2000s, up until 2014. They went to the cafeteria, we sat down next to them, they'd wander into our offices. When I was a U.S. Central Command commander, I had a Russian officer on my staff. Why did we do that? Because the democratic nations are willing to be transparent in an effort to deter hostilities, to create understanding. The Russian army knew that NATO was no threat. To this day, they know that, and we can prove it, because they have moved their troops off the NATO lines, and they're down attacking in Ukraine. You would not do that if you had an ounce of intelligence if you thought there was an, a threat from NATO. They know NATO is no threat. So the Western alliance, what they are doing, and the Western the like-minded nations, they're giving a democracy the opportunity to defend itself. We are not defending. We are not taking the war on ourselves. They are not a treaty ally, but we are pulling out all stops, and we can continue to do this. But don't forget the human factors remain dominant even as new technology comes in. Do we need good technology in the Indian Army? You're darn right we do. Because the more India is strong and speaks for India, the more calm things are going to get in this world. So we want that sort of strength, but we don't need it in the hands of a creature straight out of Dostoevsky who's going to act on his impulses of hatred. There's a new old player in the game now, and it's called China. And there have been uh, statements from the US warnings on potential Chinese intervention and arms uh, supplies to, to Russia. And there have been reports in the recent past about America's own preparedness in the event of a conflict with China. Do you think the US is prepared to open another front? And do you think that is the direction we are heading into? I have absolutely no doubt the U.S. is prepared, but the whole point is, is deterrence. And one of the reasons we want to be adamant about our support of what's happening in Ukraine is because China is watching everything. And if Russia is successful at violating the sovereignty of that country, why would we think that China that has declared a friendship without limits, why would they not be more attuned to moving against India on the line of uh, actual control in the South China Sea against Vietnamese or Philippine uh, interests or against the people of Taiwan. Uh, what we have got to do is understand you cannot, you know, I, I would put it this way, cr credibility is not divisive. Either you're credible or you are not. 
And we have to show credibility in accordance with the UN Charter, and we have to stand by uh, here in Ukraine, because if we want to dissuade China from doing something that would upset, completely upset, not just even the region, but the world, is to make sure they see that dictators cannot be successful in this sort of offensive operation. General Campbell, in 2021, global military expenditure crossed $2 trillion for the first time. And this was the seventh consecutive year that military spending increased. With the way things are going, would you say this trend would continue? I think it is, in, it, it is likely to continue. Uh, I'm not suggesting that necessarily is a good thing. Uh, technology is driving the cost of military capability and uh, the anxiety in the international system is driving uh, the preparedness or propensity to expend. Much of that anxiety emerging from scenarios such as the conflict in Ukraine or the extraordinary military build-up that we do see in some countries in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and uh, as an example of that, uh, the scale and also the rate of development of the PLA has been uh, unmatched since the Second World War in terms of capacity, technological sophistication uh, and uh, comprehensive scale but not necessarily as equally matched in terms of transparency, understanding, that sense of confidence building that General Mattis uh, mentioned. Uh, so the most complete expression of a nation's interest in the world is through statecraft, which engages all of its elements of national power in a fashion that comprehensively seeks to build security, uh, stability and prosperity. If we find ourselves in a setting in which more and more uh, of national wealth is expended more narrowly in the military space, that sense of statecraft is weakened. And it's statecraft that builds peace and prosperity. It's inclusive of military capability that is the hard edge of deterrence and, again, credibility, but it's not exclusively that. And that, I think, uh, is the key question. What is that proportion of resource that's being applied across the breadth of a nation's capacity to influence the world around it? Look, uh, I would just like to add to what uh, the Australian CDS is saying. You know, we are living in a very uncertain kind of world right now, and uh, the global peace is kind of a flux. So in this uncertain world, actually, every nation is preparing for the other, for some kind of a contingency. And uh, if you look at it, uh, as I was mentioning earlier that, you know, uh, earlier we thought that wars are going to be short, swift, where we're seeing a longish kind of a war. So why should nation, where what kind of a conflict should nation prepare for? And so obviously we are looking at you no know, talks about uh, endurance, war fighting, stamina, etc. So if you look, there are a large number of lessons actually uh, with this. What we are seeing is some kind of an you know, arms race. And if I won't say arms race, uh, means all nations are building tech. Means and you look at say South Korea, their exports have multiplied so many folds. You look at the defense budgets of most of the countries in Europe, again, much beyond the actual capacities to produce, actually. So they'll have to look at, you know, production houses outside. So these are times of uh, large amount of change. But the basic question is that for what kind of capability should you prepare, actually? For a short, intense sh uh, war? Or should you prepare for a long kind of a haul, what you're seeing right now? Because both those things, require different type of weapon sets and technologies, actually. For a short swift war, probably you'll require high precision weapons, etc., long range strikes, whereas what we're seeing, you'll require a large number of conventional weapons, large talks of artillery ammunition, tank ammunition, which are conventional in nature. 
and that will give you that kind of an bow fighting stamina or endurance. So we'll see uh, both types of things developing. One which is actually smart, the other would you may call it dumb, but will require numbers also. And in the case of India, you also have non-state actors. What? In the case of India, you also have non-state actors uh, that, that pose a security yeah. threat. So in case of India, actually, the, we would like, we have to uh, see that what kind of challenges can be faced in future. So uh, we don't think that there are going to be a, a long drawn out kind of a conflict, what's happening in Europe. So or, or ideally, we should have a healthy mix of both. And mm -hmm. in case, what I mentioned actually earlier, uh, self-reliance or Atmir Bharta goal, uh, that gives us a capacity actually to produce those what is required in large numbers. And for technology, of course, we still will dependent on friends and allies like Jim Mattis was talking about. Uh, you think we're on track for self-reliance? Oh, yes, I mean, so we just taken some baby steps actually for past two, three years. Large number of initiatives have been taken by the government. And I think if for these initiatives to succeed, the driving force would be the services themselves. So they've got to get their things right. And if they force the thing, then certainly we'll be able to uh, achieve whatever the government wants. General Mattis, since we're talking about uh, an arms race and uh, more uh, military spending, uh, we know the US is the only country that has used a nuclear weapon in combat. Um, and now we heard the Russian president saying that they're not going to abide by uh, the requirements of the New START Treaty, the nuclear pact. Do you, do you find yourself, or does America find itself in a new sort of arms race, a nuclear arms race with Russia and China? And do you think that's, that's unavoidable, this, this expansion of nuclear arsenal? You know, we have to again look at the role of leaders here. Uh, we have heard a cavalier talk about use of nuclear weapons from Putin that we never heard from any part of the USSR. The Politburo, old men who'd been through war themselves, they knew how horrible it was. They knew that no matter what we had to avoid uh, nuclear war. And there was a, there was a consensus on this. Uh, during the height of the Cold War, uh, during the Reagan administration, we were engaged with the Soviet Union and we removed 75, combined 75% of the nuclear weapons on the planet. That was an understanding by the USSR and the Americans that we had to get this number down and keep working. And out of those days came these arms agreements uh, to limit it. And I think that uh, what we have heard out of Putin is because he's alone, there is no Politburo, there's him alone. And as this, uh, as this talk goes on, uh, it's good to see that the Ukrainian people have been unbowed by it. They have been, they simply will not quit. Matter of fact, uh, recent discussions with people on the street, with grandmothers, with boys getting drafted to go off to fight, with families that have lost their boys in this fight, asked, the Ukrainian people asked, what happens if he uses a nuclear weapon? They're steadfast. They say it increases the cost, it does not change the outcome, we will still have a free Ukraine. So my point is we need to get back to nuclear arms control, we need to get back to talking about these things. Putin has got to quit just discarding the treaties or violating the treaties the way he has, and get back to what we had before and get the whole world back on this track to get rid of these horrible weapons or at least keep going down little by little. I don't know that we'll ever get to zero again until we get a degree of trust in the world that we have not, we have not seen in our lifetime. But we can work on it and keep working it back down. Uh, the tragedy is that under Putin today, this is not the Russia of 20 years ago or 10 years ago or five years ago, and we have to we have to marry our time. For right now, all NATO could do was to say, in a very through uh, Secretary General Stoltenberg, was to remind uh, Mr. Putin when he started talking about using nuclear weapons, simply to say NATO is a nuclear armed alliance. He said no more than that. The message was, don't think about it. And thanks also, I must point out here in India, to Prime Minister Modi's firm statement about no use of nuclear weapons. 
Uh, I think that India has a connection to Russia that may have made that message uh, a strong and effective message uh, that we are thankful to your Prime Minister for. General Campbell, since we're talking about unconventional war, uh, how big a role do you think uh, the narrative war plays in deciding the fate of a conflict? Although it is not necessarily new, military strategists have always spoken about uh, the power of narrative. Would you say that social media has, has, has made it more evident? I want to just pull back to that idea of unconventional war. Uh, war is something that is fought any way a combatant can fight it. And from my perspective, within the rules of war, within, within the laws and rules of war. But that's not the perspective of some countries. And Russia, unfortunately, is demonstrating that uh, in an extraordinary sense. Now, below uh, nuclear conflict, my point is that every medium of uh, competitive opportunity is going to be exploited in conflict uh, from an Australian perspective and from the perspective of the nations here uh, in the panel in an ethical fashion, not necessarily so by others. So we see cyber uh, the, the public narrative, the uh, exploitation of uh, information and disinformation. We see all of that happening. I don't think that we should any longer see this as in some way unconventional and hence not innately inherent in the opportunity to prosecute <coughs> modern conflict. Because if it is an opportunity, one belligerent or other may well be prosecuting it, particularly in a setting in which at least one of those belligerents, uh, President Putin's Russia, is not prepared to abide by the laws of war. And there's an extraordinary campaign to create the narrative of Russia as victim, uh, Russia as being uh, the defender. Uh, and uh, that is rubbish. Uh, but technology enables that. And we are going to see that use of narrative as a normalised form. It always has been, but now the opportunities for narrative to be ubiquitously disseminated instantaneously and at scale and volume is with us and it will be used. But the biggest tech companies are in the West, and last I checked, they'd cancelled a lot of the Russian media, so I'm not sure uh, how, how effective, what you say, this, this, this campaign to, to present Russia as a victim has been. And I think that we've seen uh, Russia over some decades now a profligate user of cyber methods of information, disinformation, and uh, offensive action. So I don't think that Russia is lacking in the capability to project a narrative. It is simply a narrative uh, that is at great distance from truth. General Chauhan, are soldiers today more uh, sensitized, more cognizant of the power of narrative? And are you, are you sort of shaping your strategy to make the most of it? Well, again, I think, you know, uh, as far as uh, combatants are concerned, they should be focusing more on kinetic operations. Narratives will be built around it. Uh, that's my view. But uh, war is not uh, means fought only by combatants in today's modern war. So that's where actually the battle of narrative comes in, because the whole nation actually gets involved into it. I remember, I mean, I was a colonel actually, when we fought the Kargil War of Vijay. That was the first televised war. So people in India took the war to the bedroom side. That's what uh, was said, actually. But today it's on to the social media. So ordinary citizens can participate into it, give their views, etc., and build that. So obviously the whole nation gets involved, apart from the armed forces. But yes, armed forces should be focusing on kinetic, and that will build the narrative. That if you lose that, 
then the narrative will be entirely different. Narratives are important, yes. I cannot uh, deny the significance of narrative because, you know, it gives you a notion of victory for the nation as well. So even a smaller victory can be portrayed as a large victory. So it's important. Uh, but for us soldiers, I think uh, we should also focus on the kinetic aspects of it. General Mattis, how do you see the role of the media? And do you think increasingly the media is being co-opted in, in, in the war that, that governments and countries Well, I await? think that's always been the case. The difference now, and your question's an excellent one, is the speed and the pervasiveness uh, the speed with which the message gets out, how pervasive it is, not just in your own society, but across the world. But I think that we're at a point in time when people start doubting certain things, and that doubt uh, starts seeding in to the societies. And what we have to look toward is how can we, how can we educate our young people to be critical users of the information, to be able to decide based on multiple trustworthy sources, what's truth and what is not. But I think for people with my color hair, we have to recognize we're going to have to do a better job of selling the values and the attributes of democracy about why this freedom of thought, freedom of speech, the rule of law, why those things are so important. Because once you have an establishment of values, there are certain ideas that cannot take hold you will not turn on people for malicious reasons. You will not allow mendacious news media to influence you. You'll be more critical when someone comes in with a country of 100, uh, 160 million people, whatever, and says a country of 40 million people was a danger to them, and their armies are already 50 kilometers inside that little country, as if they're somehow being the victim and they, they're simply defending themselves. You, you stop believing that people can just lead you along by the nose and say this is what you should think. And I think it's very, very important in the democracies that we go back to step one. Why did India, when it got its modern day independence, why did it choose democracy? Why, it, it didn't have to choose democracy, could have gone another way. Why did the founding fathers, founding mothers of India choose democracy? Why is it so important that we be able to divide truth from untruth as we try to keep our societies working for the good of not just our own countries, but for the other countries? And that is something we're going to have to work at. That's not going to come automatically when the double-edged sword of, of social media is out there providing as many lies as, as truth. As a former British prime minister put it, in the old days, a lie can get halfway around the world before the truth can get its pants on. Well, today, a lie can get 27 times around the world in a couple of seconds before the truth gets out there. And we're going to have to create that kind of understanding with our young people. Right, and, and this is a bit of a dig digression, but since you've mentioned democracy, how do you answer the critics who say that democracy has, over the, the years, become a convenient argument for Washington, because you've had some undemocratic allies in, in, in West Asia, for instance, and the U.S. was happy to do business with the, with the Chinese as long as it worked out, and uh, now China is seen as a threat. Well, I, I don't think I have a good answer for you on that. <laughs> um, it's a challenging question. Let me, let me do an ambush here. It always works in the military, doesn't it, Tommy? <laughs> How would you answer that one? <laughs> you answer it in national interest, sir. <laughs> <laughs> that a paramount. Well, that's why I'm not, I was never the Secretary of Defense, and you were. I thought <laughs> you would have a better answer, but okay, I get it. <laughs> I think that's an interesting note to wrap on, and I'm getting the signals. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for your very interesting insights and inputs. And I know that we live in a very complex and chaotic world. And congratulations to all of you for doing your best to keep your country safe. Thank you. Uh